welcome to today's webinar, Hand in Hand, Trauma-Informed Care and Motivational Interviewing. I am Alyssa Curtis, and I will be moderating the webinar today, presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council as part of our spring virtual training with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. This session is being recorded. Today's session is a 60-minute presentation with the last 15 minutes reserved for Q&A. There's a chat box below the presentation slides for participant questions and technical issues. Please type your questions or technical issues in the chat box at any time during the presentation. A select number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Remaining questions will be logged and provided to the presenter for a written response after the webinar. If you're having technical issues, you may also call the Council's office at 615-226 2292 for assistance. This session is accredited for one continuing medical education credit hour through Vanderbilt University Medical Center. If you plan on claiming credit, please copy the information in the CME Information Notes pod to the right of the slides and follow the instructions. The text in code will only be available during the session. Our presenter today is Ken Craybill, the T3 Director of Training at the, Social, at the Center for Social Innovation. Ken has worked in health, behavioral health, homelessness, and housing for more than 30 years. As the director of training, he develops curricula and provides training nationally in best practices, including motivational interviewing, outreach and engagement, housing first, trauma-informed care, and renewal for care providers. Ken, thank you for being with us today. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'm actually delighted to be here, and uh, thank you for being here. I imagine some of you are hunkered down in uh, drifts of snow. I'm hunkered down here in Seattle in uh, sort of torrents of rain, and some of you hopefully are getting a good dose of sunshine today. But, uh, wherever you are, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. I am, uh, I, I actually uh, worked for a Healthcare for the Homeless project uh, in Seattle here back when uh, Healthcare for the Homeless first got its start in around 1985, and so that's really where I cut my teeth, so I feel like this is a bit of a homecoming for me. Um, I'm a social worker by training and have done a lot of case management and clinical work with folks in shelters, in uh, housing situations, on outreach, and so that's kind of my great background. And one of the things that happened when I started working in homelessness in the early 80s is uh, there were really no best practices that we could rely upon, uh, except by the seat of our pants doing what we thought was best. But um, as you all know, in the ensuing years, we've had a, a whole wonderful array of best practices that have emerged, including Housing First, including trauma-informed care, including motivational interviewing, and, and many more. And one of the things that I have thought about for quite a long time, but haven't seen a lot in the literature, and uh, nonetheless have, have felt like there's a really important link between trauma-informed care and motivational interviewing, which really are the two best practices that seem to rise to the top in virtually all homeless services and housing programs. And uh, my goal today is, is hopefully for you to see that linkage and make connect those dots uh, I'll try to connect some of those dots for you, but I, I hope that you will be listening in a manner that you can connect those as well. So let's go ahead, and, and I should say I, this is going to be a fairly fast-paced uh, webinar, meaning that um, I'm going to kind of keep on going, but I do hope that in the last 15 minutes we can have a little bit more interactive uh, time together. But let's begin by just, I'm going to invite you to take all of uh, 10 to 15 seconds, but just, if you would, uh, center yourself. Take a few deep breaths, perhaps. Uh, just ground yourself for a moment, and, and, uh, and then we'll move from there. So I hope that finding that center for you is something you do on a regular basis in the midst of your work, uh, before you see patients, clients, before you go to a meeting, in the midst of meetings, uh, I, I just have come, become convinced that we need to slow ourselves to a solid place within us 
in order to practice best practices, but in order to be uh, a healing presence for people in, in whatever we do. So that's just a reminder. I'm going to ask you to participate at this point and um, either feel free to type if you would. I'd, I'd love if you would, some of you would type. Just in a word or a phrase, how might survivors of trauma that you know complete these sets of stems? And when I talk about trauma here, I'm talking about interpersonal trauma to be sure, but also about historical, insidious uh, trauma, systemic trauma, structural trauma uh, that also has to do with uh, racism and, and sexism and homophobia and all, all those things that press down upon people, um, particularly those who don't live in a in which whiteness is uh, supreme. So, so we're going to talk about trauma today. And I'm going to ask you to just bear that in mind. But uh, I'm getting some responses here, you know, that the world is unjust, it's rigged, the world is self-centered and egotistical. Uh, yeah, it's unfair, overwhelming, it's a threatening place, it's scary. Uh, yeah, exactly. What about they always think that I, and, and they would be anybody who's around us, they always think that I am what or do what. Um, I'm realizing I'm not seeing the entirety of this. There we go. Um, they always think that I, maybe we would say, uh, did it or am to blame or I uh, sort of did something wrong, I'm withdrawn, uh, I don't care about my own. Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm stupid. Uh, yeah, these are very common responses. I will never be, what, what might that sound like if you completed that sentence? I will be, or I, I don't matter, I'm not good enough, I never will be, you know, uh, able to be successful, I'll never be clean, uh, sober, I'll never be financially stable, you yeah. know, I'll never be anything, a success, uh, have a good place to live, a place to work worth anything, uh, I'll never be the same as others. Because of me, how might we fill in that? And there's just a few more here. These are great responses. Uh, because of me, my kids were taken away maybe. Because of me, uh, you know, I, I have caused a lot of trouble for these struggles. Uh, because of me, others feel threatened or scared. My family is a mess up. Uh, my boyfriend committed suicide. Ah, whoa. Yeah, because of me, uh, people I love get hurt. Very good. And I am, I am, and we've already kind of touched on this, uh, but I am nothing. I am worthless. I am hopeless, helpless. Now, this is, this is hard stuff, isn't it? And one last one, which shifts it a little bit. If they really cared, if those people at Healthcare for the Homeless really cared, They'd help me. They would leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, which might be the best way of helping sometimes, right? Uh, or they went and intruded my life. If they really cared, they'd do more for me. They'd listen to me. They, yeah, if they really cared, they'd have a home. So these and, and many more responses are ones that we can imagine people would respond with. And, and so, as is very apparent, the worldview and the thought processes of people, particularly who have endured ongoing trauma, often starting in early childhood, uh, it develops, not only does their brain develop differently, but their thoughts and their processes and their, their world, way they view the world and others changes. And it's often uh, not very helpful at all. So for just the very beginning of part of this webcast, I, I, I want to enter into the shadows list with you a little bit and provide you with a few metaphors which you may or may not have encountered. Uh, these are ones that I sort of come up with based on quotes and things from others. But I'll just share these because, again, it just speaks to, I, I think, what we're talking about we encounter. One of the things about trauma is it's unspeakable. It's not something we should talk about and nor do we talk about very much. And uh, Peter Levine, one of the uh, very good writers in, in this field in healing trauma, says, trauma is the most ignored 
avoided, denied, misunderstood, and untreated cause of human suffering. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, we also hear from Judith Lewis Herman, who was really a seminal writer around this topic of trauma and recovery, saying it's ordinary for us. That it's common for any of us once when we experience atrocities or trauma or when we hear of other people's experiences, we just want to banish it from our consciousness. It's just too hard to take in. And so one of the things, too, that we know about the unspeakable is that we've begun speaking about the military involvement and violence related to combat and things like that. But we also know that we still, as a society, don't talk very openly or readily about the trauma that happens within families, which is really the primary source of trauma for, for many people. Uh, so it's unspeakable. We dare not speak about it, or if we do, uh, people will kind of change the subject or walk away. Trauma is also a vacuum sweeper, a lawnmower. One of the things that we notice about it being unspeakable is that we do, when we do speak about it, it, it becomes sort of a metaphor. We, we use metaphors and we use stories to talk about it. Somehow that is, is a little bit more uh, able, able to be taken in. I share with you a, a poem here uh, written by a formerly uh, who wrote uh, and, and shared poetry in a compendium of books by uh, here in Seattle. But she says, trying to get close to my mother was like getting close to the vacuum sweeper. Being close with my father has been being close with a lawnmower. And so for each of us, as we hear that, we, we can develop different imagery. But you know, I think what we commonly would see is, in one case, somebody, this person's experience was to be drawn into the vortex of this other person's life and subsumed and, and losing one's own identity. And then in the context of being with the father, it, it sounds like her experience was she was always being cut down the size, if you will. And so that's that's not uncommon, of course, uh, that, that people experience these kinds of things. Uh, again, Peter Lee, people from their bodies. In love, we are swept off our feet. In trauma, our legs are pulled out from under us. I would also reference here a book by Bethel van der Kolk, who some of you know, uh, who wrote a book. Uh, basically, the title is uh, The Body Keeps the Score. It's about trauma. And he makes the case in this book that um, Whereas there are certainly psychological and social uh, kind of components to trauma and the impact, absolutely, that primarily trauma affects us at a cellular level, at a bodily level, body function level. And so it, uh, you know, it, it creates um, disorder, if you will, in the way our bodies function, as well as in our psychological and, and social selves. So trauma is also normal, and this is one that uh, doesn't, it's not intuitive, but one of the things I read is a story of a, a, a woman in Mauritania, and I'll share this brief story here in the next few slides, but there's this idea that trauma happens, and if you don't have a larger context, given your life experience, it feels like it's normal. It's like anyone else's life. I was taken from my mother when I was five, and every day I looked after the herd. Every night I was raped by my master. I always thought without understanding that this was normal. In Mauritania, where I'm from, hundreds of thousands of people are still held this way today. But I was lucky. My brother escaped his masters and found an organization working to stop slavery. He asked them to help free me. And then here's the kicker. But when they came to take me away, at first, I completely refused. I couldn't imagine this was the only life I'd ever known. And we see this, of course, in domestic violence and interpersonal violence, where uh, obviously leaving seems like a logical thing from the outside looking in. But from the inside looking out, it's much more complicated than that. And then lastly, we know that trauma is a thief. And I'll ask you again to just type a few things in the chat box. What does get stolen in just a word or a phrase? What, what are the kinds of things that get stolen when people's lives are impacted 
especially in a chronic, repeated way by trauma. What are the kinds of things that people begin to lose sight of uh, in what they're doing? And I've seen lots of uh, typing here. A sense of safety and self-worth and innocence. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, sense of control, freedom, and sense of agency. You know, all of these things get stolen. And, uh, you know, here's a list that repeats many of the things you're saying and, and maybe includes a few more. But, but when we think about and just even ponder all of the different things that people uh, kind of lose a grasp of, lose sight of, you can see how that worldview that we start with, with those sentence stems, um, relates to, to this. And so I bring this up because uh, we need to recognize that part of being trauma-informed is to understand trauma and its impact. And I'm only touching on it here. There's so much more to be said, and I know many of you on this call know a lot more about it, but for the purposes of our call. But I also wanted to share this idea that you all recognize too, and that is that recovery is absolutely possible. And of course, it will look very different for each individual. But um, I don't know if any of you know this particular Japanese art form or the name of it. Uh, you get extra points if you want to type it in. Uh, but by the time you type it in, I'll put it up here. <laughs> so this is called Kintsuku, right? Um, and it's, it's a beautiful metaphor, I think, for how when things are broken apart or uh, they're, they're sort of uh, made into, things are falling to pieces, literally, that there is the possibility of helping to mend and build and rebuild and put them back together again. And, so I think this is a really critical piece of understanding that recovery is possible. And that's really at the heart of being trauma-informed, is helping to create conditions under which people can experience recovery. Uh, we certainly, I don't believe, can recover people for them. We can't empower people. We can't change people. But what we can do is we can create the conditions. And I often uh, go back to a quote by Madeline, uh, Madeline Hunter, I think, who says, they say that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But I say, you can salt the oats. And to me, that's a nice metaphor for how we, in our work, can help people become thirsty for change, for, for finding transformation in their lives, for finding recovery. And so that leads us to well, how do we have conversations with people in order to foster post-traumatic growth? And that comes in the forms of uh, maybe new social relationships, new uh, opportunities for involvement in the community, uh, for creating changes within relationships that exist or creating new relationships. It also is about helping people discover what they have inside them already, which is sufficient, actually, for their own recovery. People already have many, many strengths. They have wisdom. They have capabilities. They have uh, pretty much all they need in order to recover. And, and what we can do is help shine a light on that. Post-traumatic growth also has to do with helping people create a different worldview than the one we were talking about earlier in which there's also a sense of appreciation for the beauty in the world and grace and forgiveness and uh, offering forgiveness as well as receiving it. And, and all of these things that uh, help people lead a more balanced life and a more satisfying life. And then also that deepening sense of spirituality, meaning, purpose, uh, having a sense of belonging, a sense of place in the world and then contributing uh, in ways that make sense uh, to the world. So it's, it's a two-way street. Um, so all of these things are part of uh, the term post-traumatic growth, which I really like a lot. And so what we know is being trauma-informed is important, and it is a strength-based framework that emphasizes you know, building these opportunities and helping 
people build a sense of control and have kind of empowerment. And these are the principles, and I know that I shared with you last week, for those of you who are on the call, whoops, I'll go back there. Um, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but, but you can see here what some of the key principles are related to uh, being trauma-informed and, and working with people, and there's more. Um, and so all of these are, are things that have been cited in the literature and by people involved in this, uh, in this world of, of what we can do to to help foster recovery uh, for people. So motivational interviewing enters the picture here in my mind as a particular way of having a, a helpful conversation with people and of, of interacting with people. And, and motivational interviewing in, in kind of a broad sweep is simply an approach to having a, a helpful conversation. Uh, and, and helpful meaning <laughs> Uh, being engaging, being building trust, uh, being able to then begin to focus on what the person's concerns are, to elicit from the person what it is that they themselves want to, to focus on uh, and work on and potentially make changes around and then developing some plan of action around that. Uh, so motivational interviewing is both kind of a broad way of being with people, but it's also a more kind of focused way of having a, a conversation. Now, I'm going to offer this, but I, I won't wait for you to <laughs> respond. But uh, if you ever think about it, every time you have an encounter with another human being, you're faced with the question, uh, what am I going to say next? Now, some of us respond next with uh, saying things that just come off the top of our heads, which sometimes works. Uh, sometimes it's not the most helpful. but Motivational interviewing is kind of like being mindful about what we say next and thoughtful and even strategic. Uh, you don't have to be that way all the time, but, but when we're having these conversations, we, we want that. So here, here's a situation where you can see trauma as kind of an underlying situation. Sometimes I'd rather be back living outdoors in my tent. Maybe this is someone who's lived, moved into permanent supportive housing recently, but having my own place and having my own place is nice and everything, but there's others who deserve housing more than me. Now, our impulse would be probably to say something like, oh no, you're very deserving. You absolutely deserve this as much as anybody else. But if, we, if you look at that more carefully, what we've just done is discounted what this person said and undercut what they said and cut them down, kind of like a lawnmower. And even though we were trying to be helpful, what we were doing instead was we were imposing our viewpoint, our opinion, which is benign in terms or, or a good one in some ways. But, but what we're doing here is we're wanting to talk with people in a way that honors and ex their autonomy, their choice to explore what's important to them, not what's important to us, and not imposing our stuff on people. And so, some of the ways that we might respond to this person with a statement that shows you are listening, and those of you who know motivational interviewing, you know we call these reflective statements, we might say, and there's all kinds of possibilities, we might say, you kind of missed something about living outside. Because what we're doing here is we're, re we're responding back with a listening statement to say, hey, I'm seeking to understand and to get a sense of your point of view, not to put my point of view on you. And so this might lead to some interesting conversation. You kind of miss some things. Or you're having mixed feelings about being here. Or this has been a big change for you. I hope you can hear the empathy in these responses, because that's really one of the most important connecting points in being trauma-informed, is being able to show empathy. And we don't show empathy by saying, oh, I'm so empathic with you, or empathetic towards you. No, we, we do it by listening well. You can see positives in both situations, okay? And, and then you're feeling uncomfortable living indoors when others are still out on the streets. You're uncomfortable, or you care a lot about others who are still out there. What that, says, that statement does is actually draw upon and name a person's strength that you see in them, a quality that you see in them. They're compassionate. They care, right? 
or you wish everyone could have their own place. That's another way of saying uh, you aren't just about yourself. You, you care about others. So this is not a course in motivation we're doing, that we're doing here today, and it's not a skills building. But I, I wanted to provide this because reflective statements are at the heart of good communication, particularly when we're working with people who might be feeling untrusting of us or might feel like they're not being heard oftentimes. And, and motivational comes into play because it's a way we listen well to people. And there's something incredibly powerful about just listening well, just listening well. Now, this same person might be helpful questions. And some of those might sound like, well, tell me about your life before moving here. Or what did you like about living outdoors? And what didn't you like so much? So we're getting kind of to the ambivalence there, right? What are the good things about living here? I'd be interested in hearing more about why you think others are more deserving. So rather than assuming that the person is deserving, help me understand what makes you say that. And what we're doing in that case is we're beginning to say, tell me your wisdom. Tell me your point of view. Tell me your way of seeing things. Because I'd like to understand that. I'd like to hear that more. And of course, in the process of people talking more and being invited to talk more about what they think and feel, what we're doing is we're helping them gain a sense of empowerment and control over, not over, but, but understanding and self-understanding that, that often is critically important. What does it mean to you to deserve housing? What would be different if you deserve housing? So all of these are possible questions and or, as in the previous slides, uh, statements that we might make. And of course, uh, open questions and reflective statements are, are kind of the two most prominent uh, skills of MI. So MI, as many of you know, is basically described as a collaborative conversation style. So you see the partnership there already for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment to change. So the good news is we don't have to motivate people because we can't. Uh, but what we do want to do is assume that people already are motivated. Maybe they're not motivated to do what you want them to do, but they are motivated. And they're motivated to live lives that are fuller and more happy and more uh, successful. And, and, and they have all of that within them already. And we want to help tap us into that. Um, and that's the thing is, it's a person-centered counseling style to address the common problem of ambivalence. So one of the things that in my mind is very trauma-informed about MI is that instead of assuming that people make poor decisions uh, just because they don't, know, they don't know better or they want to be hurtful or they're manipulative or all these terms we use, what we're really saying is you're just like everybody else. You happen to be homeless. You happen to have trauma in your background. But, you know, we're all people who who feel two ways about changes. And each one of us right now, today, is ambivalent about something. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee that. So ambivalence is a way of approaching people from an MI perspective instead of saying you're in denial or you're trying to be purposefully hurtful or you're trying to you know, hurt me or something like that. You recognize this. Uh, it actually is kind of the Nike symbol, but it's not quite the same as the one we see in, out in, in the media. But uh, this is what that symbol means. And this is the nature of ambivalence. And it's why I, I say that we all experience it, because uh, it's just a natural part of our being. And so when we approach people in that way, we're basically saying, so you know, in this situation, uh, getting housing or looking for a job or going to the doctor or going to the dentist or uh, seeing a, a counselor or working on this particular plan is something that you kind of want to do, but not really. And let's explore that together. And so again, MI, I think, is very trauma central to people's dilemma. And then what we're trying to do is help people talk themselves into changing. Uh, using their ideas, their concepts. And this happens, uh, and this is an incredibly oversimplified way of thinking about it, but in a, any conversation or series of conversations, when we explore with people their own concerns, ambivalence, their values, their hopes, their goals, their strengths, 
that out of that will come conversation in which people will say, I'd like to, but I can't. But the I like, I'd like to, or I want to, or I could is preparatory talk towards change. And then we hope it would move at some point towards something along the lines of, I'm going to. I'm going to at least take this next step. I'm going to make an appointment. And, and then people take steps. This is how we change, all of us, uh, sometimes in a very rapid uh, fire kind of way, and sometimes over months and years, for that matter. But this is the, the journey of change that we're trying to guide people through in our motivational interviewing approach. The idea here being that people already have within them a lot of wisdom, expertise, and including motivation. If we provide the proper conditions and support, it's more likely to uh, come to the fore. Now, this is a photograph of a girl. Uh, you're welcome to, if you would, at first glance, just tell me what comes to mind. What's your very first reaction in terms of um, a word or a phrase? Just curious if you ever met this girl or have been this girl. She's pouting for sure. Uh, she's mad. Uh, we might say she feels entitled. No, I won't. She wants a candy bar. She's stubborn. She's having a yeah, she's, uh, she's She's kind of stubborn and dug in, and she's not going to do what anybody tells her to do, right? Now I'm going to show you another picture of another girl. And I'm going to ask you, uh, what, what are the strengths that you see in this girl? And I'm just going to ask you again to type a word or a phrase. What, what would you say are, are the strengths that you see in, in her that you think, wow, that's pretty cool? And so I'm scrolling down. She's empowered. She's self-confident. She's not going to give anything up without a fight, right? She's going to stand up for what she believes, and she knows what she believes. Determined, strong, stubborn, yes, in a good way, right? I mean, that has two edges to it, right? She believes in something deeply, and she's not going to take no easily for an answer. Uh, Terry asks, is that the same picture? Uh, well, let's, let me go back to the other one, and I'll let you decide. Well, it looks pretty similar, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you know, the, the idea here is that if we change the way we look at things, then oftentimes the people or things we look at will change. And, and the reason this is so critical to motivational interviewing and all of our approach in healthcare and behavioral healthcare is that how we see people makes a huge difference. And we can see the per and, and, and both sides are true. She is stubborn. She is dug in. She is, you know, she's a brat, maybe. But she's also an incredibly gifted, talented, strong person who I would want to have in my life. And, uh, in fact, my own daughter kind of was her. It's not my daughter. But, uh, but the way we see people is the way they can also begin to see themselves or borrow from that view. And so if we say to people, well, stop being manipulative or stop being a brat or stop you know, being so angry or stop being so demanding, that's one way of seeing a person. But that's actually not who they are or what they're trying to be. That's how you see them from your own point of view. But what if we said to them, wow, I really like the way you stand up for yourself and you advocate for yourself and you try to get your needs met. And I recognize it's, it gets complicated and, and you don't always, that doesn't always happen. But that's something that you can build upon. That's a very different way of, of seeing and talking with people about who they are. Another way of looking at this is we can see people with a glass filled or a glass empty. And the fact of the matter is, we're all filled with the same stuff, regardless of our background. We've got this combination of hurts and hopes and dreams and nightmares and addictions and healthy desires. We're all delusional and connected to that, but we also have wise wisdom uh, and so on and so forth. And so motivational interviewing is not so much about giving people what they lack, which when you can see that expert to non-expert approach is a very belittling, disempowering approach. But what if we evoke from people what they already have, saying basically, you already have what you need, and together let's find it. I love this quote, and I, I would make a bumper sticker out of it, uh, or if nothing else, I would put it on my desk. But what if we approached everyone we met with the attitude, you already have what you need, and together let's find it. 
that transforms our whole way of, of seeing and, and then uh, helping people, I think. So a quick run through the spirit of MI, which is what we call the mindset and heart set. So partnering with people uh, in which we, we demonstrate a profound respect for that person and see them and their expertise as being very, very important. And then we can bring our own expertise as well. There's, it is a partnership. But first and foremost, we tap into what people already have inside them. And we dance. We don't wrestle. And it looks like kind of a side-by-side -side, uh, kind of relationship. And it sounds like, you know, help me understand what, how do you feel about what you're understanding of. It also sounds like I look forward to working together. How can we do this together? So that's partnership. Acceptance is, is yet another part of this. And I realize I'm dashing through these quickly. But, um, you know, part of it is prizing people for who they are and who they might become. You know, but Mr. Fuller has this wonderful quote, there's nothing about a caterpillar that you suggest it will turn into a butterfly. So in homelessness services, of course, we see people in front of us who look very much like caterpillars in you know, all shapes and forms. Uh, but we also need to see through that and beyond that and see people for who they can become from their own definition, not our definition, but see the, the possibilities. There's also the idea of providing accurate empathy. We already touched on that. One of the best ways to do that is to listen well to people and reflect back what we're hearing uh, from them and seeking to understand. I'm not going to play this video, but if any of you have uh, ever seen it or haven't seen it, I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. Just It's on YouTube, Empathy, the Human Connection to Patient Care. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic produced this. It's about a six or seven minute video that I think is very powerful uh, and hard to watch in some ways, but it also captures this idea of what does it mean to view people in, uh, from an empathy point of view. And then acceptance also is about supporting autonomy, which you can see goes hand in hand with a trauma-informed approach. You know what's best for you. Uh, this is a decision only you can make, but I'm here to help you and walk alongside you. And then another aspect of acceptance is affirming strengths. Uh, there's something very powerful about being in the presence of people who see us for our strengths more than our deficits. Uh, in fact, I don't particularly enjoy being with people who see me for my deficits. But I'll hang out with people who see me for my strengths, if it's coming from a genuine place, which it has to be. But uh, that, that is critical. And I think you know, we can ask people what you see as your strengths. And, and that can be a hard thing to answer for many people. But we can name some things we see and name them in a specific way. So it's not just that took a lot of patience. It's that took a lot of patience in a way that you waited for that person to calm down. Or that took a lot of patience to wait so long for the doctor to come to see you. Or So we, we name the, the strength, but we also describe it in detail. And then there's compassion, uh, compassion which has such a rich meaning, but it's this idea of coming alongside people in their difficulty, their suffering, their addiction, their mental illness, their physical issues, its concerns and illness. Um, many of you, some of you may know that the word passion literally means suffering. And so when we are compassionate, we are willing to walk alongside people in their homelessness, their trauma, and all of the attending things that come with that without trying to fix it. And, and I mean fix it by saying, well, why don't you try this, or have you tried that, or why don't you? That's not compassion. That's just us trying to alleviate our own anxiety so the person can get over it, uh, really. That's the subtext of the message. But what if we took an approach like this, a compassion that can stand in awe at what people have to carry i.e. trauma and more, rather than stand in judgment about how they carry it. When we approach people in this way, they are much more likely to be freed up, if you will, to then begin to imagine what a future might look like. But if we continue to try to fix people's trauma, what they'll do is continue to tell us probably how much they're hurting because we haven't heard. And so there's this fine line between being with 
in solidarity with, and then also helping to guide people towards looking at possibilities for change. And then the last of these is evocation, a really critical piece of all of this, evocation being literally to call forth. So when we elicit from people their own knowledge, wisdom, strength, motivation, whether you're an outreach worker, whether you're a, a physician, a nurse practitioner, a medical assistant, a behavior health person, uh, whatever your role, a human being, uh, it's when we, we, we tap into what people's already existing breadth of, of understanding and knowledge is, uh, what, a, what a full gift it is to be in the presence of people like that, right? And then, of course, we will share some of our own understandings as well. So evocation sounds like many things, but maybe it's initially, what would you like me to know about yourself? Or tell me about, or what concerns, if any, do you have about, or how would you like things to be different, or so on and so forth. But I think we have to start with engaging people before we start trying to come up with solutions. If you like acronyms, PACE might be a nice acronym to keep in mind for these four components here. So here's um, the, the, the micro skills of MI in uh, basically five minutes. Uh, but we all know these. But these are skills that need practicing. And uh, the, the O, of course, is for open questions that might sound like these kinds of questions. And I like the one, I like particularly one, for example, that says, how do you know when your anger is and is not well controlled? Or how do you know when your diabetes is and is not well controlled? That's a way of eliciting from people and, and some self-understanding and self-awareness, right? What does meth do for you? And what are the downsides of it? There we're saying we acknowledge that people do stuff because they're trying to meet their needs, right? Even if it's also doing damage. Help me understand both sides of that. What if we ask, what strength do you bring? Or what would you lose if you gave up drinking? That's another side of the ambivalence, right? If you were to leave this relationship, why would you do so? And of course, we might say to ourselves, well, there are clear reasons to do so. But we want to invite people to articulate for themselves why they might make a change, not to tell them why we think they should. What ideas do you have? What do you think? So you notice that open questions often start with what, how, uh, sometimes why, although not the kind of why questions that pin people to the wall. Or tell me about. Affirmation, as I touched on briefly, again, these shine a light on, on what's good about a person. And yeah, we can say, I love that. I love what you're wearing. Or we can say, you know, it might be something very seemingly insignificant. That's an affirmation. But it's also even more so when we name something that we noticed about a person's effort or what they did, regardless of the outcome. So something they did, an attempt they did, uh, and name it clearly and just state it in a, a way that is genuine. But affirmations have the effect then of reducing defensiveness, strengthening the relationship, building hope, and, and building confidence. Uh, and they sound and very much more. You'll have access to these slides, so I'm just going to keep on going. But uh, And then there's reflective listening. And uh, we could spend uh, maybe a day on practicing reflective listening. But really, what we're doing here is giving people a good listening to. And that's really our role. Uh, and, and we do that by reflecting back, much like light bends back uh, in a mirror, what we're, what we're seeing. Uh, we're bending back what people say and we're adding a little bit to it. And so we use starters like it sounds like or it seems like or for you, or you're wondering or you're feeling or you're hoping or you're thinking. These are all ways of going beyond what a person says and slightly guessing what might be around the edges of that. And so the essence of reflective listening is this idea of making a reasonable guess, small guess, not a big guess in the form of a statement about what a person means. This is a skill, and it takes practice, and it doesn't come naturally to us. But it, it's at the heart, I think, of being trauma-informed, of learning how to reflect in a way that uh, isn't, isn't communicating that I'm trying to read your mind, 
but it's communicating I'm seeking to understand. And then summaries are just really collections of reflections. Um, and they can be useful at any time in a conversation. But when we take a few moments to say, and here's what I've heard so far, uh, and we gather a few things together, uh, especially things that point towards hope, point towards the possibility of positive change, if that's where we're conversation is going, uh, can be very powerful. And then the ORs plus I is all about the idea of how do we provide information and suggestions in a trauma-informed way. And again, it's about choice, autonomy, and one of the ways that we can do that is we can elicit first, tell me what you already understand about depression, or what do you already know about the effects of, of using heroin, or what do you already know about what happens when you don't take your meds, uh, whatever the topic may be. What would be helpful for you to know, and would it be all right if I provide you some information? So we ask permission as a way of saying, I'm not going to impose or intrude upon you. I'd like to ensure that this is something you're interested in, willing, and ready to, to listen to. And then we offer what we've got in, in just a small dose. Maybe it's advice. Maybe it's a suggestion. Maybe it's information. Maybe it's a test result. But we offer it, and then we elicit it again. Elicit, provide, elicit plan with you, or what are your thoughts, or what else, else would you add to that, or what other questions do you have? So this is a very easy kind of formulaic way of thinking about it, but when we are going to offer something to people, it's always helpful from a trauma-informed perspective to first ask permission and find out what they would be, what would be helpful to know. And then I'm going to have us wrap up here uh, by just saying that motivational interviewing has different processes or stages. And, and so we have to find ourselves in these conversations and determine, are we in the midst of engaging with this person as a person, getting to know them for who they are, and not focused on a thing? Or are we at a point now of we're going to focus in on something that we want to talk about? And of course, again, we offer choice. What what you'd like to focus on today? And then, the evoking process, that eliciting that we talked about, is around the focus. So if the focus is on uh, seeing the doctor, uh, then we, we talk to the person about their concerns. Uh, what concerns you? What, are, what would you hope would come from that visit? Uh, you know, why, what would be some good reasons to do that from your point of view? And then if planning comes to be, uh, we, we plan. And when I think about planning, I don't think of a grand plan. I think of what's the next step you might take. And so it's, again, to recap, uh, engaging is building that relational foundation, creating safety, the critical part of being trauma-informed. And that's both in terms of the physical space, the emotional, psychological space, showing a warm welcome, showing genuine interest in the person as a person, as a human being. And then focusing, finding a direction, uh, because that's also safe. That's a way of saying, OK, let's contain this conversation and figure out what we're going to focus on. And then we begin to ask, tell me more about what's working, what's not. Uh, if you were to make this change, so this is helping to envision a future, why might you do that? What might be your best reason? How might you go about it? How important is it to you, given everything else in your life? How confident are you? So again, these are all, I think, approaches that honor a person's uh, integrity, value, voice, uh, all of that, and, and say, that's what I am seeking to hear from you in this very kind of um, relational way. And then planning often sounds like, what do you think you might do next? How might I help you with that? How can others help you, et cetera? Ideas, and then we'll open this up. Uh, a therapeutic relationship is a partnership. Yes, we have expertise, but so does the other person. And so we share that back and forth. Acceptance, compassion are at the heart of our interactions in all cases. If not, it's just going through the motions. Motivation to change is something we elicit from people. We don't have to motivate people to change. We can't. Uh, what we can do is make a difference. 
And that's really the power that we have, is to make a difference in people's lives, not to make things come out. We also know that direct persuasion to get people to do things or to resolve their ambivalence uh, is not effective. In fact, most people will push away even further and go in the opposite direction when we push on them. Uh, we use a guiding word. Uh, both a consultant as well as somebody who provides a, some sense of movement ahead, but we also, uh, that the person also is, is guiding us as well. And then it's the task of the individual to resolve his or her ambivalence and come up with reasons for change, not ours. So I'm going to stop there and invite your comments, your questions, and I believe that uh, they're going to be, somebody's been gathering these, so uh, Thank you for your attention, and, and let's see what happens here. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. That was a huge amount of information, and we're just so grateful. We do have a couple questions for you. One from Brianne uh, says, how would you use MI to overcome client barriers to housing, for example, those with criminal hist histories or past evictions? It's a great question, and actually one in which MI doesn't apply. Uh, because the issue there is there are systemic structural issues that are getting in the way. So it, it, we wouldn't have a conversation with a person about how can you become more motivated to make the barriers go away. <laughs> um, so, so those are advocacy issues in my mind that, that have not to do with the person directly. They have to do with the system in which we work. Now that said, if a person comes to us and they say, well, I can't get housing, uh, and they're ambivalent because they want housing, but they say I can't get it because of such and such and such and such, then, then I think it does warrant a conversation with them about, OK, I, we, we recognize that these are things that we need to work on. Let me see, let's work together and see what we can do to find a place that might be able to work with you around this. And, uh, and so we, can, we maintain the partnership. We maintain the, the sense of I'm in this with you uh, alongside your struggles. But there, there isn't a, an internal intrinsic motivation issue, in my mind, that is prominent in that one. That's, that's more of a systemic issue, as I would see it. I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Ken. We have another question from Ashley. What do you do when a client looks to you for advice or wants you to tell them what to do? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I, that happens a lot because, for one, we've kind of uh, trained people to not have wisdom or opinions of their own, right? And so oftentimes one easy, I think, strategy to use is when people ask, I, I say, you know, I, I actually do have some ideas that I'd, I'd be happy to share with you, but before I do that, would you be willing to, to tell me some ideas you have? And, and maybe a person has none. And, and I might even, even lead the conversation with, well, you know, that's something you might think about. Maybe next time we meet, we can talk more. Or it might be a situation where you say, well, would you be interested in hearing some ideas I have? And, and again, I would put them out, not in a big, long laundry list, but just in one or two, maybe, and just say, and, and get the dialogue going. And so you're speeding the conversation by, by posing a possible thing that that person might uh, take on. I will say this. When a person comes to us and says, uh, can you give me some bus tickets? That's not an MMI moment, uh, unless you have to have a discussion with it. But you know, there are times people come to us when it's not calling for MI. It's sort of like, OK, just give the bus tickets or whatever your protocol is, right? Uh, what we're really doing is using these uh, conversational styles around things that people are feeling ambivalent about. And, and virtually everybody who has a chronic condition of any kind where self-management is involved or self-determination, uh, it's ripe for a conversation, I think. Thank you. As we know, many of our providers have a very limited time with clients. So how can we engage these strategies and honor our client's experience in short bursts of time? Yeah. You know, the beauty of MI is that it actually is a very effective brief intervention. And brief can be 
as much as one well-placed question or reflection that causes the person to think a little differently about the situation, a brief might be you know, a two or three or four minute conversation. Um, I, I will say that it takes more time to have that conversation than just to tell the person what to do. That if you add up all the moments that we tell people what to do, even nicely, in which they still don't do it, we've just wasted a lot of time. Whereas if we're willing to have a slightly different framing of conversation, it's more likely the person will make a change. So there's a lot of good research out there showing that very brief interactions uh, can have a huge impact. Uh, and, and there's research from uh, interactions in ERs to all other places as well, but that's one that comes to my mind. So the other thing about MI is the conversation time you have is not the end of the conversation. Because if you ask an interesting question, even if it's something like, well, what might get in the way of your making it to that appointment? And, and even if they can't answer in the moment, they might carry it with them. Or if we ask people, so what's it most important to you right now? They're going to carry that with them, potentially, and at 2 a.m. wake up and say, huh, this is it. Uh, I mean, that's the hope, that, that, that a conversation that we begin and see is actually an ongoing conversation the person's having in their own, their own life and mind. Great. Thank you. This question comes from Heather. Can you use MI to help someone accept that they need mental health care? If so, do you have any tips for us? Well, anytime we phrase a question of using MI to get somebody, uh, we're, we're, we're already in a non-MI way of thinking about things. And at the same time, I really appreciate the question because our impulse, we, for, for very good, we want to help people recognize, get, change, whatever. Um, I don't have an easy answer for that. I, I think what we're doing when people aren't recognizing the need, at least recognizing it overtly, because I think people at every, I, I, I truly think that everybody has inside them some awareness that there's something awry in their lives, whether it's about mental illness or whether it's around drinking. It's sort of like I've never, I, I've met plenty of people with alcohol problems who have said, I don't have a problem with alcohol. But I've never met a person with an alcohol problem who didn't know in some deep level that they had a problem with alcohol. So I think in the, what we're doing is we're trying to tap into that hidden piece, if you will, that has some recognition. And the way we do that around mental illness, because then we have a lot of issues that get in the way, right, uh, just chemically speaking. Uh, but we might begin to ask questions around the mental illness. So it's not so much, do you have a mental illness? It's, so, so tell me about your sleep, or tell me about uh, your relationships with others. Tell me what you would like different in those. What, what, what doesn't work so well? And it's beginning to explore the person's life uh, and direct concrete issues in that person's life uh, without necessarily directing it towards the, the presence or absence of mental illness. I don't believe people have to recognize they're mentally ill to get help for mental illness. Um, so I, I hope that's at least somewhat helpful. I hope so, too. This is our last question. It comes from Kim. What do you tell yourself when you get frustrated when you see a lack of progress with a client or you feel like you're not being the best provider for that client? Well, that happens pretty much a lot. Uh, I know in, in my direct service experience, I, my experience was an ebb and flow up and down. I kept searching for meaning, for ways of keeping myself uh, sort of hopeful. Uh, I think we all find our own ways. I do think centering ourselves, breathing, uh, taking care of our own health and well-being outside of work and in work are all ways to do that. Um, I also think in the long run, it's not putting our hope on the results or the outcomes. And I actually, it's kind of a, there's a quote by Thomas Merton, which I really appreciate, who says, do not depend on the hope of results, uh, which if you're a sports fan, that's a very good quote to keep in mind. Uh, but it's also a good one for, for when we are doing this, because the results we see are often incremental and slow and sometimes don't exist at all. But 
then again, there are these breakthrough moments. And, and I think we have to be hopeful in all the small incremental changes, even if it's the person willing to engage with us who is otherwise isolated in their relationships in the world. Even if they're willing to show up, there's something about that that I have to, I guess what we have to do is redefine hope and redefine success. Uh, that's one thought. There's, there's a lot to be said about that, but thanks for the question. Yeah. I think that's a very uplifting note to end on as well. Um, and with that, I want to thank everybody for joining today's webinar. A link to the archived webinar and slides will be available at our website, www.nhchc.org, at the conclusion of our spring virtual training. We anticipate those being uploaded probably the first week of April. Questions that our presenter was unable to respond to will be addressed via email if possible. As a reminder, in order to claim CME credit, you must text in the provided code within 24 hours of this session ending. At the close of the webinar, an online survey to evaluate it will automatically open in your web browser. Please complete the survey to help us improve your experience, and the meeting will now be closed. Thank you.